So I guess my first question is, can you cheers? cheers. <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about how you got interested in clinical psychology and CBT? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> and so the evening has just begun. <laughs> but we shall see where this goes. <laughs> But uh, in all seriousness, I, uh, I grew up in a, a large family in Nebraska and Iowa mm -hmm. with uh, five brothers and a sister, uh, and uh, really uh, became interested in why they treated me the way they did, <laughs> and also why I treated them the way I did. <laughs> and uh, some of my friends here, Dan Houlihan, my good colleague from Minnesota, uh, who I go fishing with every year, knows all of my brothers and brother-in-law and knows family members, and my daughter, of course. Uh, but it's a great group of people, and so I just had interest in, in people, first of all, mm -hmm. and then psychology more broadly. Right. And uh, I really had no uh, interest in clinical psychology when I first went to graduate school, mm. more developmental psychology. So I really view myself even today as a developmental psychopathologist mm -hmm. with interest in clinical Developmental psychology. And how did the CBT interest come about? Well, it was in a nefarious way. Nefarious. Nefarious way, yes. See, see. I was actually trained back in the, uh, I don't want to date myself too much, but the late 60s, early 70s. And the program I, I was in was primarily psychodynamic mm -hmm. uh, and uh, humanistic. Uh, and uh, I was uh, doing a postdoc at Devereaux and, uh, in Philadelphia and uh, working with autistic children. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were trying to treat them, and my good friend Al Finch and I were there together as postdocs. Uh, and uh, this dynamic supervisor was saying, you can't use anything other than dynamic principles. Right. And these were kids who were doing some in really incredible things, like self-injury, self-stealing, biting their lips off, and other things. Uh, but, you know, it, it became clear that I had to do something more than what I was trained to mm -hmm. doing. And I looked at uh, Ted Ione and Nate Azrin's book, The Token Economy. Right. So okay. my first foray was in behavior uh, modification, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then eventually moving more to behavior therapy. And then the light shone on me and cognitive behavior therapy came to the horizon. <laughs> yeah. And there I was. <laughs> okay. So then, you, you, where do you live now? Tell me about your family today. Well, I, uh, we have lived in Virginia, at Virginia Tech, in Blacksburg, Virginia, beautiful part of the country. I've been there. Uh, you've been there, all right, good on you. Uh, Dirty Dancing was filmed there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, those of you who know me from ABCT know that I'm a dancer, well, I was a dancer. Uh, uh, although my daughters wouldn't necessarily agree with that. <laughs> but I, right there. But I was a dancer, right <laughs> I was a dancer. Uh, but we had, it's a lovely part, it's in the Blue Ridge Mountain area of Virginia, it's gorgeous. I've uh, been at Virginia Tech now, it'll be 40 years at the end of this mm -hmm. uh, year, in, in January of, of 2020, it'll be okay. 40 years. Wow. So we've loved it there. It, it's at Virginia Tech, which is a very, very fine, great university. And you've been married for how long? One. <laughs> uh, let's say uh, uh, f uh, 53 years. And children. I know you have children and grandchildren. I have two daughters, uh, Lori and Christine, who's in, lives in the San Antonio area. Uh, and uh, she has three sons, mm -hmm. uh, and Katie, Kathleen Marie, uh, who's here in Athens, Georgia, uh -huh. has her doctorate in physical therapy. Uh -huh. uh, and she, too, has three children, two daughters and a son. Okay. The youngest one is about to be five. And he says, Papa, this is how to use your your computer and how to use <laughs> So he has taught me right. how to put apps on the phone. Yeah. Got it. So then, I know you mentioned how you got started with behavior modification, but what drew you to studying fear-related disorders, you know, phobia, panic, and so on? Yeah, that's something I've oftentimes reflected upon, and I one thing I can recall <coughs> yeah. is, is that as a young boy, um, I grew up in a very, um, a, a very poor, family background. Uh, uh, we did not have indoor plumbing, for example, until I was seven years of age. And we had an outdoor toilet. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was about seven or eight years of age, uh, when my two siblings, a brother and sister who were twins, were born, six years after I was, uh, we finally got indoor plumbing and we had a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. 
a, ref a refrigerator, you know what that is, see? <laughs> uh, and uh, they make ice cubes in refrigerators. And uh, my mother would always say, uh, Tommy and boys, be careful, you can choke on those ice cubes. Well, I, I was the derelict son, and I said, I'll try them. And I had an ice cube in my throat, and I choked on it. So I had like a, a, a kind of a mini panic attack, I suppose. Certainly right. a very acute. Uh, How old were you? I was uh, about eight or nine years yeah. of age at the time. Oh, and I really thought I was dying. And oh, I thought, right. wow, this is, this is really pretty powerful how events like this can happen. Sure. So I um, became interested in fears and anxieties and phobias mm -hmm. as a result of it. My first uh, uh, publication was in 1971, right. uh, uh, before my daughter was born, by the way, 1971. <laughs> uh, but I, I say that because I was using a, a form of psychodynamic therapy called implosive therapy. Really? Uh, so we had the first single case study on implosive therapy. Wow, that's so interesting. Yes, which was a psychodynamic based uh, exposure type therapy. So that was wow. really what started. It was 1971 that publication. Oh, that's really cool. And I know that now you study um, more intensive, sort of concentrated treatments. Yeah. So what dro what draws you to that? And yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, of course, many of you know uh, Professor Lars Ernst from the University of Stockholm. Well, I was talking with him several times here at ABCT over the years, and he said, uh, what are you doing? I told him we're doing these different programs and interventions. Uh, and he said, they're taking too long. He said, you gotta do it more quickly than that. Uh, and if you know Lars Jorn, he always wanted things to be done in one session. Yes. <laughs> so we began to look at one session treatments uh, as a result of that. And it was a, a matter of showing that one session treatments were equally effective uh, to those of more standard based mm -hmm. uh, treatments. And uh, to this day at our center, and several of the people are here from there, we, we do work with one session treatment. But we also see a few individuals who come in for OCD mm -hmm. for like a uh, intensive, concentrated, brief mm -hmm. intervention for one week, so they come in. One of our recent studies was called Half Phobias Will Travel. Oh, wow. And if you remember uh, Have Gun Will Travel from way back, uh, an American uh, film, uh, well, that's title was taken off after that, Have Phobias Will Travel. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to show that there are ways to deliver these treatments to people who can't get them mm -hmm. in their usual settings. And they would come from all over the US, and we've had people from Europe call, but we've discouraged them so far. Uh, I just got back from Spain, and I was doing a workshop over there on one session treatment. Wow. other countries, so we're, we're hopeful that it will catch on. Well, that's really exciting. Um, I did, forgot to mention, I asked you earlier, but could you talk about some of your seminal papers in, in the field of your disorders? Well, the most uh, published studies are one with Diane Chambliss, who mm -hmm. some of you probably know, on evidence-based treatments, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the most frequently cited one, and then the Fear Survey Schedule, which I developed in 1983, mm -hmm. yes. is now in 30-some languages, and so that has uh, caught on. And led to many kinds of mm -hmm. interactions. Uh, so those, I think, would be the most seminal, but our, our CBT work with uh, phobias yeah. and anxiety, I think, are among the more uh, prominent ones. Okay. So now, I guess, what's on the horizon? I mean, I know you received your PhD in 71. That was 50 years ago, almost. Not quite. <laughs> Nearly. Nearly. And then, I mean, I'm not going to list all the awards, but like really so many awards and just 10 days ago, a year, a day ago, whatever, you know, it's not, not happening. But what is on the horizon for you? For you? Well, the, the problem with a lifetime award is that there might be uh, an implication. Not from us. There might be an implication that your life is nearly over. No. Uh, as I tell my wife, Mary, and daughters, and others, that it's half time. It's half time. Uh, okay. uh, we're, we're still going strong, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Cut down a little bit. Okay. The students can't keep up with us as much as they used to. <laughs> Just kidding, students. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> He's working us too hard. <laughs> uh, but you know, seriously, I, I intend to continue to work on these things. Mm -hmm. and we're doing uh, some stepped care things that we want to do. We're doing these projects over in Germany and the Netherlands now that are taking these uh, one session treatment protocols and taking them out into the community mm -hmm. into uh, effectiveness trials. And down in Australia, we're doing two or three trials there uh, where we're augmenting our CBT treatments with either decycloserine or with mm -hmm. uh, emotion regulation strategies or with attention retraining. So we're trying to advance what we're doing 
Uh, as I have said in my writing, CBT is really darn good, mm -hmm. but you know, it's only addressing about, as we all know, 50 to 60 to maybe 65% yeah. of people we, we work with. Yeah. And I have six grandchildren now, and I say that because, you know, if only, if, if all of them went in for treatment and only four got better, that ain't good enough. Yeah. That is simply not good enough. That was a good way of putting it. We, we need to do better. We need to better what we're doing. So we need to look at moderators and mediators of treatment and really advance. So I think we're at, at a really seminal point here. Yeah. You know, Bob's work over here, Bob Leahy's work, and others who are here just uh, incredible work in Northern Europe and other places that are going on. Uh, just fascinating things that we, yeah. need to, we need to move the field forward. We, we, we cannot rest on our laurels. I think we have a great foundation. Yeah. And I hope we don't lose it wherever we go. I hope we keep the foundation in learning theory mm -hmm. and in developmental theory, yeah. and cognitive theory, mm -hmm. behavioral theory, social psychology, and we really are broadly trained yeah. and that we can continue to advance the field. It's, it's exciting, I think. Well, that's great. It's great to see the excitement even now. That's fantastic. Yeah. So I, if, if anybody has a question for Dr. Olenbeck, this would be a good time. Mm -hmm. Time as I know it's moving, but if somebody has a question I haven't asked that you'd like to ask him. Sensing none. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's such a pleasure to speak with you and to learn so much more about what you've done. Um, I'm so delighted that you accepted this award. Thank you so much. Well, and let me thank you, Lottie. Lottie and I have worked together for the last several years on various committees, and to see all the uh, work that has been done in the formation of the the Confederation of CBT is just incredible with several folks from the from UK the and other places here uh, tonight uh, just to see that unfolding and you serving on it. I don't know if Keith is here or not from no, Canada, not, no. uh, but other people who are involved in this. It's just, it's just amazing. We finally got, I remember way back in 1995, not way back, but a few years ago, uh, and uh, we were in Copenhagen and forming the some of the initial work with Bajor and Erst as the chair of the yeah. organization at that time, and just really thinking, wouldn't it be great to do a world organization? And it's now here for the first time after all these years. It's, yeah. it's terrific. Yeah. I'm very excited. Well, thank you so much. Oh, there is a question. So since you use the metaphor of halftime, at halftime the coaches usually go in and consider, they have to revamp their strategy, so what they're going to be doing in the second half. And given uh, Lars is uh, kind of challenged about doing it faster and shorter, uh, what do you think uh, would inform your work now if you'd imagined you'd been born with indoor plumbing? <laughs> I can't imagine life with indoor plumbing. <laughs> I, I went to school in my first three grades in a one-room schoolhouse uh -huh. in which there were uh, 12 students and five of us were brothers. <laughs> K through eight, I had one classmate. So you see, my background is probably different than many of yours in terms of uh, cultural things and sociocultural things. You know, I, I think um, we, we really do, though, need to advance. And I, I think um, we are making some paradigmatic shifts, I think. And, mm -hmm. and certainly the th what's called the third wave is really important. But I think the third wave uh, has to really uh, uh, procure more support and especially with children and adolescents, uh, sort of adults, it appears to be working quite well, but with children and adolescents, less clear how that's gonna work. So I think we need to do more work there. And again, I really think looking at uh, moderators and meters, I wanna go to a kind of a personalized CBT, like personalized medicine, mm -hmm. uh, to get to the point in our practice, as well as our research, that we identify that for this child, this will work, and for that child, that will work. And we can tailor it more, so we can get above 65%. That's not good enough. You know, so. Uh, I, I think it's a matter of, of really advancing it, but I think our foundation is good, so I don't want to give that up. I think it really is looking at for whom what we're doing is effective, and why is it effective for those persons, and how can we really come to the science of that. Uh, so I don't think we need to throw out CBT. I, I'm not at all in favor of that, and I'm so glad to see that the, this association has long been a fan and a member of ACT, but has widened its branches to CBT, I remember in, when I was president of, of AABT, as you said, that was yeah. just behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, we became behavior and cognitive therapy. So I think it's that kind of movement that's really critical. Yeah. Great question, thank you. <laughs> All right, I guess on that note, I wanna just uh, thank you so much for agreeing to come. Thank you.
and eat. And eat more food. And eat more food. Yes, there's plenty. Enjoy. So now, Katie, you can tell your mom you won the Academy Award. I know, I know. You spent the day at the end of the day. I'm going to put it back in the same way. Okay. Thank you. 
Well, I want to enjoy you. <laughs> <laughs>